So um, I'm going to break this talk into two parts. One, talk, one part will be talking about um, HIV and the insights in, into testing and, and sort of transmission and, and residual risk uh, that we've gained through studies of blood donors and recipients. And then I'll switch actually slide sets and, and talk about uh, the GBVC virus and some recent work that we've uh, done on the effect of transfusion transmitted GBVC on HIV disease progression. But just to uh, emphasize that uh, for blood bankers, we care a lot about acute infection because we want to prevent the transmission of HIV from uh, window phase infections. We introduced antibody testing for HIV back in the 1980s and quickly realized that transmissions continued because donors were giving during the early window period when they were still viremic and seronegative. So this has led to the introduction of progressively more sensitive tests that can now detect HIV infection very early using um, nucleic acid or, or RNA detection assays. But in, in addition, acute infection is very important from the public health perspective because people who are in acute infection are highly infectious um, and drive the epidemic to a great extent. Uh, if you treat patients early following acquisition, you actually do gain some benefit with respect to further suppression of viremia. And that may result in, in reduced secondary spread of the epidemic by detecting people in the early stages, both preventing them from transmitting to others through behavioral uh, you know, insights and notification, but also by treating them and driving down the viremia, a topic I think Bob Grant will probably talk about. But in addition, by identifying people in very early acute infection and following them, we can gain insights into the early pathogenesis of the infection. Uh, this is an old slide that uh, just sort of illustrates the evolution of acute viremia um, in white and then the P24 antigen period and then the detection of antibodies. And the earliest tests that were introduced in the mid-1980s, the first generation assays, were it took about two months following infection before those early antibody tests could detect the infected person, be it a blood donor or a diagnosed patient. But with progressive evolution of antibody tests, that window was closed to about 20 days. And then now with addition of nucleic acid testing, the window period is perhaps as little as about 10 days. Uh, now the insights into that uh, window period have been gained through, uh, through application of, of tests to longitudinal samples, particularly from plasma donors, a topic I'll, I'll touch on in a minute. But this, just, this slide, uh, a recent um, updated slide from the CDC, shows how from the point of RNA detection to the point of positive Western blots, many different tests can detect infection at different time points. And in general, uh, the uh, second generation assays are, are the type of tests that are used as rapid tests, point of care assays that can be done in field clinics. Third generation immunoassays can detect infection you know, quite a bit earlier. And then now, throughout the world, we have fourth generation tests that combine P24 antigen and antibody detection. So in diagnostic settings, as well as in blood screening, there's been a progressive effort to try to close the HIV window period. So throughout the world, beginning in 1999, blood banks have introduced nucleic acid testing, and, and in addition to antibody testing, in order to close that window period. And what you see here is a recent uh, results of a recent international survey showing which countries introduced tests, nucleic acid tests for RNA or DNA to the three major transfusion viruses, HCV, HIV, and hepatitis B virus. And you can see at the upper left that the majority of countries initially focused on introducing hepatitis C nucleic acid testing. And then through the course of the 1990s and 2000s, HIV testing was introduced in many of those countries. And then over the last five years, almost all countries have moved to, to detecting HBV in addition using what we call triplexed assays that simultaneously screen donors for all three viruses. And this has allowed detection of donors with the acute window period infections. And this slide just summarizes by continent how many window phase infections for HIV, HCV, and HBV have been detected. So you can see here that overall at the bottom, uh, there's almost 300 million donations have been screened by NAT, and the, uh, and the yield has been approximately 250 HIV window phase, 
680 HCV and uh, about 2,000 HBV window phase infections. So this is very important because these units would have transmitted HIV. And I might mention that Brazil over the last several years has introduced um, HIV and HCV NAT. Now one of the other advantages of doing the nucleic acid testing is that we've uh, gained insights into the window period through studies of, of longitudinal samples, particularly from plasma donors. And one of the contributions was a, a concept of staging early acute HIV infection. Uh, a colleague of mine, Ebby Fiebig, uh, working with me back in the mid-19, um, late 1990s, developed the so-called Fiebig staging criteria, which define the period of time that from the acquisition of infection to detection of viremia, the period when RNA is positive before P24 antigen can be detected, and then as the immune response, the serologic immune response matures through the development of a full Western blot. And this um, approach has been then exploited by uh, other groups um, in, in collaboration with us where these plasma donor panels have been studied to characterize the diversity of the virus. And work led by George Shaw and the Chavi group uh, studied a large number of these seroconverting plasma donors, um, characterizing the virus at, at multiple time points during the ramp up phase of acute viremia. Um, and determined that the vast majority of these infections were actually derived from a single transmitted virus, a founder virus. Uh, and the concept of the transmitted founder virus evolved from this work. Uh, by, again, by extrapolation of the sequence data back, you could impute the nature or the, the exact sequence of that consensus virus that was transmitted and that managed to break through the bottleneck uh, of the mucosal barrier that um, I think Ashley Haas will speak to. And again, in the majority of these infections, a single virion appeared to have seeded in, and initiated what became a disseminated viremia. Um, in a subset, uh, two to five virions were transmitted and, and, and simultaneously initiated the infection. So what I was um, just showing you was uh, the results that I'll skip through, but basically the important premise here is that uh, in the United States, in addition to regular blood donors, which is what goes on uh, throughout the world, as I just summarized, there are what we call these source plasma donors. These are individuals who come into a collection facility twice a week uh, and give large volumes of plasma that is not transfused, but is used to create plasma derivatives, immunoglobulins, factor concentrates, albumin. And it's a very large program, over 13 million donations per year in the United States. And the real unique value is that these individuals, when they do seroconvert to HIV or other viruses, we have stored large volumes of plasma that was collected twice a week. Uh, and it's through use of those units that we were able to characterize the early dynamics of acute viremia, defining what I summarized a few moments ago, the, the FIBIG staging criteria. And this is another slide from that initial paper just showing how as the um, infection evolves, the viral load uh, ramps up and then achieves an early peak and then stabilizes into set point. And this is what we looked at a few moments ago and, and discussed. So we're back in, uh, in gear here. Um, again, I talked about the global experience with um, introducing nucleic acid testing and the yield that we've observed. So what I want to move on to now, back on track, is um, these window phase donations are, are quite important, not only uh, because we prevented them from transmitting HIV and other viruses to patients, because they represent this, this transmitted founder virus from, derived from large-scale population screening. And around the world, there's about 120 million donations per year. There's about 3 million per year here in Brazil and about you know, 15 million regular blood donations in the United States, but it's a global program to support patient needs. So, um, and it's the detection of these acute infections from blood screening gives us the opportunity to characterize the transmitted virus on a, on a really global basis. And this is important for multiple reasons. One is we want to be sure that, that the tests we're using, the diagnostic assays, the confirmatory tests, are sensitive to the evolving HIV variants that we know are constantly mutating and recombining. So by capturing and, and characterizing the virus in, in these window phase donors, we can 
use those samples to assess the performance of tests. Um, we can also characterize and monitor the transmitted virus, um, both with respect to the diversity in terms of the genotype, but also the resistance of the virus to antiretroviral drugs or the evolution of the envelope that might be occurring over time in terms of um, the, the resistance of the virus to neutralizing antibodies with respect to vaccine development. And again, we can also uh, follow these individuals over time, enroll them, and study early pathogenesis. So this has led to a program that, uh, that Esther's been quite involved with that we've built that's uh, a part of a, a global uh, research team called the REDS team, which stands for Retrovirus Epidemiology in Donors. And this program has conducted molecular surveillance um, in the, the multiple countries, US, Brazil, South Africa, and China. Um, we're focused uh, particularly on the acutely infected donors who are detected either as NAT yield, meaning window phase before antibody is present, or very early seroconverters that we can document um, either because they were observed to go from negative to positive with respect to the viral tests in a short period of less than six months or a year, or using incidence assays that can dis discriminate recently transmitted virus antibodies um, as they evolve from uh, people who have long-standing infection. So this program um, has launched and is now uh, reporting results. This data, this is a paper that's in the current uh, last issue of Journal of Infectious Diseases that was the U.S. experience, and this reported uh, data from about 30 million donations in the United States. Uh, the HIV, HBV, and HCV infected donors were identified, were sorted into incident infections, again, either NAT yield infections or uh, very recent seroconverters, and then the genotypes and drug resistance patterns of the viruses were, were characterized. Um, here in Brazil, Esther leads the Brazil red sites, which include the, uh, the Prosangri blood center here um, in Sao Paulo, Hemo Rio, uh, Hemo Minas, and also Hemope in Recife. So these centers have all participated in the molecular surveillance study um, that Esther's um, completed in the first phase, and it's an ongoing study. It's actually a case control, control study where HIV-infected donors are matched to uninfected donors. They're interviewed for risk factors, and then Esther's laboratory conducts molecular characterization of the virus. So you can see here in Brazil, just by virtue of subtype, that the large majority, about 77%, are, are subtype B, um, with a moderate rate of, of CF and CF recombinants and BF recombinants. Particularly, I think Sao Paulo is um, somewhat more heterogeneous in terms of genotype, but also we can characterize the frequency of drug-resistant virus, and this would be transmitted resistance, primary resistance, because these people didn't even know they were infected when they gave blood. So they didn't take antiretrovirals, they, they acquired a uh, a, a virus that was already selected as being resistant to HIV. So you can see that 13% of new infections that are being transmitted in Brazil harbor drug-resistant virus, and that's the highest rate is here in Sao Paulo, 22%. You can track over time the rate of detecting these window phase donations. This is data from the U.S. for hepatitis C and HIV window phase, viremic seronegative infections, fairly stable over time. And then you can look at uh, the correlates of, of incident infections based on focusing on what are the characteristics of these window phase donors who are nucleic acid positive and antibody negative. And you can see that people who present to give blood for the first time are about three times as likely to be in the window period compared to repeat donors. Males significantly more frequently in the window phase than, than uh, females, a peak in middle age groups. In the United States, a higher incidence in the, in the southern part of the U.S. Again, this is a global program, so just another example from South Africa. Um, in, in the Republic of South Africa, they introduced nucleic acid testing about five years ago, and during that period, uh, they had about four million donations and picked up uh, over 6,000 HIV-infected donations. Now, 97% of the infected donations were both RNA positive and antibody positive, but they did pick up 164 window phase infections that were RNA positive, antibody negative, and these are just broken out a little bit in more detail here. 
They also detected 43 elite controllers, people who were antibody positive but RNA negative, who on further testing, there's no question these people are infected. They, uh, they have strong antibody responses, and by repeat uh, nucleic acid testing, we can find virus uh, at very low levels in all of these people. So again, large-scale screening in the blood supply identifies both incident infections, window phase, uh, large numbers of, of chronically infected individuals, and then modest numbers of these elite controllers. Uh, this is just showing over the period of time the actual distribution broken out by uh, different donation types, first-time donors, lapsed, and repeat donors. But again, the key issues here are the large, uh, relatively large numbers of, of window phase and elite controllers. And again, we have whole units of plasma and are now enrolling these donors into follow-up studies. Uh, a new program has just been funded by NIAID in the United States, again, a global program called the, the Viral Panels or the Equipol Project, which is working uh, with blood banks around the world as well as other groups to identify and, and capture large volumes of plasma, create viral isolates from recently transmitted virus, and also track this founder virus over time in multiple countries. So looking at the evolution of the virus uh, as it, uh, it, it, in incident infections um, over time. And we're actually going back to samples that were characterized in we have available from, from 20 years ago from recently infected donors and comparing them to uh, the, these newly infected uh, NAT yield donors today with respect to detailed characterization of the transmitted founder virus, which we again think is important both to uh, make sure that tests are working well, that drugs are working well, and that new vaccines are targeting the virus that's continuing to be transmitted. I think I'm going to skip, skip this. We're already. Um, through, through much of this, so this is an active project which is now uh, funded for the next seven years and uh, already has viral panels derived from, uh, and viral isolates that are derived from most of the predominant clades around the world. Now one other question that uh, for blood bankers is quite important is we've introduced this nucleic acid testing and it can close the window quite a bit for the multiple viruses, but has it completely closed the infectious window? Are there still transmissions going on um, despite introduction of these very sensitive nucleic acid tests? And this is data recently published in the United States that shows that shortly after we introduced those early antibody tests, there were still large numbers of breakthrough infections detected um, in recipients. So we can see, you know, 15 plus infections were still occurring each year in the first few years following antibody screening. That led to the improvement in the antibody tests, which dramatically reduced the rate of these breakthrough infections. And we only detect a small proportion of what are, what are still occurring as transmissions. But even now in the era of NAT, we still see breakthrough transmissions where NAT vi virus RNA and antibody negative units still transmit HIV. And this led to some work that um, we uh, developed with uh, Chris Miller's group in the SIV macaque system to try to understand what is that minimal infectious dose of virus um, that can still transmit by a, by a blood transfusion intra, you know, intravenous infusion. And what Chris's group did was to take samples from a number of macaques that had been infected with SIV through vaginal uh, inoculation and created pools of samples from the window, from the ramp up phase of, of acute viremia. So this would have been that founder virus that was selected to be extremely fit and was disseminating in these animals. Uh, and then this pool of virus was serially diluted and it was diluted down to two copies in the entire inoculum. And when very, very low inoculum was infused into recipient macaques, um, the only thing that was observed was a transient blip of viremia that, that, uh, that did not result in sustained viremia and infection. But as few as 20 copies in the entire transfused volume resulted in, in uniform transmission of SIV. So this tells us that a very low an amount of virus derived from the window phase before seroconversion can transmit HIV, which tells, explains why we're still seeing transmission with, with NAT screening, because the virus, uh, the volume of plasma and blood that we transfuse is quite large, several hundred milliliters. So if there's as, as few as 20 copies, 
in several hundred milliliters will never detect it by the testing, which uses only a half a milliliter to amplify the virus. So it explains why a very low level viremia can still transmit. Um, now, interestingly, in this, um, in this work, we also took uh, plasma from animals that was collected well after seroconversion, so months later. And when that plasma was pooled and diluted, it took a much larger concentration. Instead of 20 copies transmitting, these animals required 2,000 copies of virus to transmit, which tells us that the virus or the immune response had evolved such that the virus that was collected uh, you know, four months after transmission was much less infectious than the virus that had been observed um, that had been derived from the ramp up phase prior to zero conversion. And in a, a preliminary study, this was published in that original paper, if you add back heat inactivated plasma from the, um, from, the, uh, from the downstream time point after the animals had zero converted, so essentially still has antibodies, but the virus itself had been inactivated, it will suppress the infectivity of the ramp up virus, which suggests that there is a a neutralizing antibody component to that reduction of infectivity. And this just uh, illustrates that again, that, that during the ramp up phase, there's essentially a uniform relationship between the infectious titer of the virus and the concentration of the virus. But once antibody develops, then the infectivity is suppressed relative to the viral load in, in the unit. And that's consistent with other, other data in human transmissions. We also have identified, this is the global summary of the number of breakthrough transmissions that have been observed. Um, in a number of these cases, plasma um, from the donation transmitted, but red cells did not. So there was a discordancy that we think is partly related to the volume of plasma in a, in a plasma transfusion, about 200 mils versus 20 mils in a red cell. But also the red cells are stored at four degrees for weeks prior to transfusion, whereas plasma is frozen quickly. But we were able to calculate the exact total amount of virus in these units that did or did not transmit. And through a, um, a, an analysis, we were actually able to calculate that in, in the real world of residual transmission by blood transfusion, it actually averages about 220 copies of virus are, are associated with these breakthrough transmissions. So not in the entire inoculum, there are 110 virions, not terribly far from that SIV macaque data. Now I'm going to switch gears now and, and just show you some uh, very new work that um, has just been uh, partly published in JID and a separate paper is coming out shortly. And this is a topic that um, Esper is quite interested in, so uh, I thought it would be good to share it. Share it. And this has to do with this uh, virus called GBV. And uh, this virus, um, as we'll talk about, was initially discovered as a possible additional transfusion hepatitis virus. But uh, over time, we've learned that it actually doesn't uh, cause hepatitis. It's a very common virus. But in recent work, what we've been able to do is go back to a, an older repository of transfusion recipients who, who were HIV infected and identify a large number of individuals who acquired GBVC following blood transfusion and then understand the course of HIV disease in individuals who actually were transfused and, and got acute GBVC infection. So this virus, um, GBVC also was called hepatitis G virus, uh, was first identified in, in the mid-1990s. It's a flavivirus, so in the same general family as hepatitis C. It's present in humans as well as in wild chimpanzees. And although its exact reservoir in, in people is not fully understood, it's thought to predominantly um, be lymphotropic. Uh, and, and it results in an active viremia that can be detected by um, standard um, RT-PCR assays, but also there's an antibody response, a, and there are no commercial assays, but a number of groups have research assays for the antibody to the envelope protein. Now, this virus is transmitted by, by multiple routes, but uh, efficiently transmitted by, by blood transfusions and other parental routes, but also sexually, and it's very prevalent. So, uh, active viremia is present in 1 to 5 percent of donors, uh, as you'll see in a bit, about 8 percent of all transfused units in the United States are transmitting this virus. Um, in some countries, like South Africa, about 20 percent of donors are viremic for this virus. In addition to the donors who are viremic, there's another group of people 
who appear to have been infected but cleared the virus and have this E2 antibody, and that's typically about four or five times as frequent as the viremia. And this com it's, it's because of the common modes of transmission, it's quite often a co-infection with HIV and hepatitis C. Now, as I mentioned, this virus is transmitted by transfusions. That was uh, proven very early after the discovery. Uh, direct sequencing of donor and recipient virus proved that uh, transfusions uh, were transmitting. Uh, the uh, virus is also very common in multiply transfused populations. So it's clearly a, a blood-borne uh, infectious disease, but it's not considered at this point a pathogen, so we don't screen the blood supply and prevent the transmission of this infection. What's not really been well documented is the exact risk or rate of transmission of this virus by transfusion. Uh, so that was really one of our goals. In terms of disease, this, um, this virus, most people who are carriers of this virus are completely healthy. There is no current evidence that, uh, that it causes any disease. It was initially isolated from patients who had post-transfusion hepatitis, but large-scale studies demonstrated that it is, was not the cause of that hepatitis. The virus, as noted here, um, has interesting interactions with HIV that have been studied for um, you know, the last 15 years or so. Uh, it infects lymphocytes. Uh, it, it seems to interfere with HIV replication in vitro. Uh, it interacts with the ability of HIV to bind to the HIV receptors, um, perturbs cytokine networks and T cell activation. And, uh, and all of these effects have been well characterized in in vitro model systems and in patients to, to a moderate extent. Um, however, there's um, the, the actual impact of primary infection of GBVC in people who have HIV has not previously been able to be studied. No one has been able to get permission to actually infuse GBVC into HIV infected patients and actually observe the direct effect of a co infection on a pre existing HIV infection. Uh, but there is evidence that uh, from large clinical studies, and I'll show a meta-analysis, that, that the co-infection with GBVC does appear to decrease HIV mortality, um, reduce viral load, and improve CD4 counts just in large epidemiologic studies. So this is the uh, meta-analysis that showed the, uh, the effect of GBVC co-infection in a number of large cohorts. And the overall combined effect here you can see is a 40% um, midpoint estimate of reduction in mortality for individuals who are viremic for GBVC in addition to having HIV uh, infection. So there appears to be a significant benefit of having this GBVC co-infection. So this is where, um, where the work that we've been able to recently complete uh, and are continuing uh, comes in because we had done a study called the Viral Activation Transfusion Study, now it's been about 15 years ago, that, uh, that led to the building of a repository of serial samples, pre- and serial post-transfusion samples from a large number of HIV-infected patients that we, that we were recently able to go back to and characterize for GBVC infection. And this was the original uh, paper from uh, uh, the VAT study. It was actually a trial to ask whether transfusions caused activation of HIV or other viruses, and whether removal of the white cells from blood transfusions would ameliorate that transfusion activation effect. Because when we transfuse people from, with allogeneic blood from other people, we're introducing a, a, a really a strong immunologic stimulus that could activate uh, a number of viruses. Uh, the overall findings from this study were actually uh, no significant difference between leukoreduced blood and non-leukoreduced blood on the effects of uh, reactivation of virus or immune activation. But what it led to was a sample repository that allowed us to go back and characterize uh, the frequency of GBVC in infection in this um, cohort of recipients. So we had 531 recipients who were all HIV infected at baseline, and they were transfused because they were, uh, had, a, had anemia and required red cell transfusions. As I mentioned, they were randomized to get either white cell uh, reduced blood, so-called leukoreduced blood, or standard blood, and they were ca carefully monitored clinically and with a variety of, of uh, viral load and immunologic, uh, including immune activation parameters, over a period of uh, up to um, three to four years, so a very strong sample base and database 
to go back and study GBVC. So what we did was to um, identify samples at baseline in the last sample from almost 500 of these patients, and they were tested for the antibody and the RNA of this virus. If a, if a donor, if a recipient developed GBVC viremia, then we characterized the interim samples, and there were very frequent serial samples, weekly specimens collected post-transfusion and then monthly samples. And uh, this is a, a little bit of a busy table, and I'm just going to hit the, the main points, but basically at the beginning we had these, um, you know, 489 subjects who were, had samples available for testing. Now the majority of these people were antibody negative for GBVC and RNA negative, so 300 were GBVC naive HIV infected patients at baseline. And after transfusion, what we found was that 39 of these patients became viremic and an additional 25 developed antibody to GBVC um, on the last visit. In addition, there were a number of patients who were GBVC RNA positive or GBVC antibody positive at baseline, and we could look at the effects of the persistent GBVC infection on the, that group as well. Uh, these were very advanced patients who, in terms of their uh, viral load, uh, was quite high. The baseline CD4 pre-transfusion was very low, and the overall death rate in this population was very high. These were advanced patients in the immediate pre-heart and early post-heart time frame. So the first focus of work was to ask, what's the rate of transmission of GBVC by transfusions into these HIV-infected patients? Uh, and again, the, uh, the main aim being to estimate the, the rate of acquisition in patients who were naive for GBVC, meaning they had neither antibody nor RNA. That's the, the main focus here. So again, the, the main question was to look at the, uh, at the patients and understand how many units of blood they received and what the rate then of acquisition of GBVC viremia was. And what the, the focus here, therefore, is on the patients who were antibody and RNA negative at baseline. And as I alluded to earlier, we had 22 who became uh, viremic on follow-up and an additional group who, who developed seroconversion on follow-up. So the overall rate of transfusion transmission, um, oh, this is the baseline characteristics of the patients, but the real thing here is, is this, uh, this first line here, the risk of acquisition of GBVC was um, 1.08 per unit. So 8% increased rate of GBVC viremia per unit transfused. So this is telling us that 8% of units that are being transfused into these HIV infected patients are actually transmitting GBVC to these patients. And um, there were some other covariate analysis. That paper is just in the recent issue of JID. Perhaps even more impressive, though, is in these patients who acquired GBVC transfusion, what was the effect on disease progression when controlling for all of the other factors in, in these patients in terms of CD4 count and heart use, et cetera? So again, the aim here was to evaluate uh, the effect of incident GBVC co-infection both on morta mortality as well as on viral load. Um, so again, looking at all-cause mortality uh, in the people who acquired GBVC versus the controls who did not, as well as the effect on viral load, uh, just the schematic. And again, the numbers here include both the people who were negative at baseline and, and became infected viremic, as well as those who seroconverted to antibody. But this analysis also included sub-analyses that um, that looked at the, the mortality rates in people who were viremic at baseline, who already had pre-existing GBVC. But perhaps the most impressive data in, in this, you know, sort of opportunistic study population was this Kaplan-Meier analysis, which really mirrors almost exactly the earlier large epidemiologic analyses from the MAX and other cohorts, which shows that people who were GBVC RNA positive particularly those who acquired GBVC from the transfusions, had a substantially lower rate of progression, uh, in this case to death, this is a mortality analysis, relative to people who were negative for GBVC infection. And actually the worst outcome, as observed by others, was in people who were RNA negative but antibody positive, who had been infected but could not sustain GBVC viremia and form the antibody. 
These patients, for reasons we don't fully understand, um, have the worst outcome of all. And in an adjusted model, the, the reduction in mortality in people who are GBVC viremic uh, is about a 60% reduction in mortality. So they had a 0.4 rate of progression to death relative to GBVC negative people. And if you include, in addition to mortality, if you include virologic progression, so uh, in substantial uh, increase in, in uh, HIV viral load rates, a similar nearly 60% reduction in mortality. Oh, this is the mortality parameter, and then this is the uh, virologic progression parameter. Skip this. So just to summarize this work, so we, we uh, have confirmed that transfusions are transmitting GBVC at a frequent basis. About 8% of, um, of these patients uh, acquired GBVC, and that's an 8% per unit risk of acquisition. Uh, the overall um, incidence of GBVC in the cohort was 39 per 100 person years because these people were getting multiple transfusions. So that's saying if you, the typical person will get you know, three or four units of blood. So uh, if you transfuse people who are HIV infected, a fair number of them will get infected with this virus because we don't screen for it. And that the, um, so the risk is, um, is actually also associated with lower um, viral load in, in the recipients. I didn't get into that. But mo most important is we are confirming the effect of GBVC. Uh, incident infection results in a dramatic reduction in mortality as well as a reduction in, in, um, in viremia. So just to mention that we have a, a follow-up study in progress in this REDS group where we've been now funded to update all the viral load data, all the antibody data, and most important to, um, to go beyond that and to look at, um, uh, at the uh, characteristics of the immune system that are occurring in these people who become infected with GBVC. So we have a number of sort of hypotheses as to what mechanisms may be responsible for this uh, beneficial effect of GBVC infection including uh, blockade of the receptor with the, the NS1 antigen and a variety of, of other immunologic mechanisms that um, or the E2 protein uh, that could be the mechanism by which this GBVC beneficial effect is occurring. Uh, so we're right now in the process of, of doing all the updated viral load, whoops, all, all the updated viral load and, uh, and then begin, and we'll begin to do the immunologic studies uh, over the next year. Perhaps uh, some of these will be done in collaboration with ESPER. Many of these patients, we do have a variety of, we have frozen blood specimens that uh, have already been characterized for a variety of immune activation parameters, very uh, careful CD4 uh, subset data, et cetera. So we're quite hopeful that this opportunistic repository will gain insights into uh, the mechanism. There's a recent review just published by Jack Stapleton that goes through the mechanisms, the in vitro and in vivo mechanisms, and perhaps one of the most compelling is that the E2 protein itself that is, seems to be expressed in excess when people are chronically infected with this GBVC virus, that that protein may actually block the receptor or the co-receptor uh, by which HIV enters cells. So it may be that the plasma from people who have EBVT2 chronic, EBVC chronic infection actually has large amounts of circulating E2 antigen, and that antigen may itself be able to mediate the blockade and, and the, of, of HIV infection of new cells and the reduction of, uh, of uh, HIV progression. But there are many other secondary mechanisms, immune-based, that are beyond my uh, capacity to speak to. So I just want to acknowledge the um, individuals who've uh, been involved with this work, and in particular, uh, actually, she's not listed here, but Farnaz, uh, who works with Brian Custer at my institute, a, a postdoc who really did those analyses and is leading the, the next level studies. Thank you very much.